All right, uh, we'll begin now, inshallah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa after the salati wa atam taslim ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Uh, so, welcome to the uh, fourth and final class on the Introduction to Fiqh uh, series. Uh, so, we'll be wrapping up tonight, inshallah. Uh, going over the remaining terms, vocabulary terms that we had started in the previous session, uh, and then uh, ending off with uh, talking a little bit about some of uh, the issues related to madhahib and differences of opinion amongst the scholars. All right, but the first thing we'll start with is uh, the quiz. The quiz, right? So uh, I'm posting the link in the chat box. So once again, if you don't have the... <clears throat> You don't have the link. This is the link for the class. Inshallah, if you don't, if you don't have the link, you scan the QR code. All right. We went over a lot of terminology. It's a bit technical. All right. So try your best. If you don't remember any of the terms, then you know you can take a guess. But <clears throat> it was a bit technical in terms of the Arabic terms that we went over in the previous session. All right. Um, ready? So you have 20 seconds to answer, everyone. Right? Remember, you answer within the 20 second limit. Yeah, how we used to do it before. All right, instructor paste. All right, uh, so we'll start. Bismillah. First question coming up. Anybody has their uh, thing? Just mute it, mute your um, sound, please. Consensus of all the fixed scholars from the Ummah in any given, uh, in any given time on a ruling should be time there. In any given time on a ruling is called in Arabic. All right, remember 20 seconds, guys. Everyone has to answer within 20 seconds. <laughs> All right, when the scholars, they have a consensus of something, this is called in Arabic, ijma. Right, scholarly consensus. It's called ijma. All right, the consensus of all the fixed scholars from the ummah on any given ruling in any specific time is called ijma. Next question. An example of consensus is the consensus of the companions that the blank takes a sixth of the estate when the deceased leaves behind a son but no father. All right, very specific examples we brought right last time. Who, who is it? The grandfather. Right? So basically the grandfather is taking the place uh, of the father. Right? The grandfather is taking the place of the father. So the grandfather is not specifically mentioned in the Quran or in the, in the Hadith, but the scholars, the Sahaba agreed that he takes the place of the father and he takes the sixth. All right, next question. Joining a matter for which there is no ruling to a matter for which there is a ruling due to a shared effective cause is called what? All right, so this is called Qiyas. All right, in, in English, the English term is analogy. Right, we make an analogy. This, the ruling is in the Quran and Sunnah. New ruling comes up. We make an analogy and we give the same ruling. This is called in Arabic, Qiyas. All right, next question. All right, there are how many pillars of analogy? How many pillars of analogy? <laughs> technical, a bit technical, right? Okay. All right, uh, so in any analogy, we need how many pillars? Anybody? Four. Anybody knows what those are? So we need the original issue, the foundational, root, the foundational issue, all right? Which is, for example, wine, all right? Wine. Then we need the ruling of that foundational issue, which is that wine is haram. All right, then we need the secondary issue, which is? Vodka, right? 
And then we need a shared effective cause that's joining them together. And this is the, what we call the illa, or the reason, the effective reason between the two, which is that they both cause drunkenness. All right, so those are the four pillars of analogy. All right, four pillars of analogy. Next question. One has a choice to follow the rulings that are derived from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. True or false? <laughs> false, right? Yeah. Can you, uh, if we say that alcohol is haram, we have a choice, you know, I can just drink if I want to, right? No. So we have to follow these rulings that are uh, found derived from the Quran and the Sunnah, right? We say alcohol is haram, right? That means you have to stay away from it. Or any other ruling that comes, we, we don't have a choice. These are ob obligations on us to follow. All right, next question. An individual obligation in fiqh is called Individual obligation is called Fard Kifai or Fard Kifai. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Fard yes, yes, yes. Fard <laughs> al-ayn, right, which is individual obligation. Everybody has to do this, right? Everybody is required to do this, like salah, like zakah, fasting. Everyone is required to do this. Next question. All right, if you got the previous one, then you should get this one. A collective obligation in fiqh is called... All right, collective obligation, for kifai. All right, for kifai. Such as offering the Salatul Janaza for a Muslim who has passed away. Such as washing the dead. Responding to the Salam, one person responding to the Salam, if somebody comes, if we, are, if we are a group of people and somebody comes in and gives us the Salam, one person is required to give the Salam. And that suffices for everyone. All right, next question. There's no difference between fard and wajib in the Shafi'i school except in the chapter of which chapter? <laughs> in the chapter of Hajj, right? So we said that uh, majority scholars do not differentiate between fard and wajib. They are the same thing except in Chapter of Hajj. Other than that, there's no difference between the two. And the only madhab that separates, distinguishes between fard and wajib is the Hanafi school. They make a differentiation between the two. All right, next question. Something that is obligatory on us to do and it is, and is a part of the action, part of the actual action is called what? All right, this is called a rukun, rukun, right? So rukun is, what it will be translated to mean pillar, a pillar. This is part of the action, such as standing in salah, right? Such as rukur. This is a pillar, it's part of the salah and you have to do it. All right, next question. Something that is obligatory on us to do, but it is not part of the actual action. Rather, it is one of its preliminaries, preconditions. It's called blank. All 
All right, and this is called a shart, right? Shart. So shart is like having wudu before you pray, right? It's not part of salah, but it is a precondition, preliminary for the salah, but it is also obligatory. All right, next question. I think this is the last question. The blank is that which the, the, the revealed law asks us to do, but it is not a decisive demand. The consequence for doing it is a word, and there's no punishment in leaving it. <laughs> Alright, the correct answer is all of the previous. Alright, all of these terms refer to the same thing. All right, all these terms refer to the same thing. Mustahab, tatawar, mandub, sunnah, they all mean something that is optional. If you do it, you're rewarded. If you leave it off, it is no, there is no punishment. All right, different terms, they all mean the same thing. All right, uh, so this was a bit technical, but you know, this is, this is part of um, studying the fiqh, right? So, to know these terminologies, all right, third, Riyadh, ocean first. Who is KM? Do we have a... That's you? MashaAllah, good. All right, uh, we'll get started, inshallah, to uh, the lesson for today. Okay. All right, so continuing on with the terms, right? Continuing on with the terms, we left off. The last thing we did was al-mandub, which is the last question we just had, which is that which the revealed law asks us to do, but it is not a decisive demand. It's something that carries reward, but there's no punishment if you do it, if you leave it. Such as praying at night, qiyamul layl. Such as fasting the six days of shawwal. Do you have to do these things? No. But if you do them, you are rewarded. If you do not do them, you are not punished. Right? This is called mandub, and there are synonyms. It's also called sunnah, mustahab, tatawwa', nafal. All these are synonyms for the same term. All right, moving on. Then we have number eight, al-mubah, which is the permissible. All right, this is what if you do it or you leave it, it's the same. All right, there's no reward if you do it. There's no punishment if you leave it off. All right, this is what we call permissible. So there's no command to do it. There's no command to leave it off. All right, we have the freedom to do it if we would like. All right, an example of that is the verse where Allah says, so in the, for Juma, Allah says at the beginning, Ya ayyuhal ladheena aamanu, idha nudi ila salati min yawm al-jum'ati, fas'au ila dhikrillah, wadharu al-bayr. Right, Allah says, when the, when the call to Juma is made, then leave off trade, leave off work, leave off all these uh, business obligations. And then at the end, once you have finished the salah, فَإِذَا قُلِيَتِ الصَّلَاةُ فَانْتَشِرُ فِي الْأَرْضِ when the prayer has been completed, once you have completed the Jum'ah, then Allah says, spread throughout the earth and seek Allah's bounty. Meaning you can go back to work. Right? But this is mubah. Right? You, you have a choice. You can go back to work or you can take the rest of the day off. Right? So this falls under the uh, category of mubah, which is permissible. Right? So Allah says, after the Jum'ah is completed, then you can go back to work or you can uh, return to your homes or you have the choice. This is permissible. All right, number nine, al-haram, unlawful. All right, this is what the, the revealed law has decisively demanded us to leave. And if we leave it with the intention of obeying Allah's command, then uh, this will be, uh, there will, this will carry reward. And if you do it, then the consequence is punishment. All right, and of course, there's many examples of that, such as killing a soul that no one has the right to kill. وَلَا تَقْتُلُ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ And do not kill any person Allah has made inviolate, except with the right to do so. Alright, so this is something haram. The, 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 the sacred law has demanded us to leave this. If you leave it with the intention of obeying Allah's command, then there is reward. Or what does that mean? If you leave it with the intention of obeying Allah's command, there is reward. What does that mean? Uh, 
How would you get reward by leaving it? Okay. But what would that require? All right, let's say, for example, somebody has an intention to like, kill somebody. And then the cops show up right before they, they kill that person. So they leave it. Are they rewarded? No. All right? Because the cop did it. But if they are about to kill that person, and then they, their heart changes, and they leave it off, this is reward. All right? So it, it has to be coupled with intention. In other words, if you just leave off something haram, not because you had the opportunity to do it, and then something got in the way that prevented you from doing it, then there's no, re there's no reward for that. But if you have the opportunity, that something haram comes in front of you, and you give it up willingly for Allah's sake, then this carries reward. Right? Like the example of Prophet Yusuf. Right? When, when, the, when, the, when the, uh, the, the mistress comes and she tries to seduce him, and he has the opportunity to do the haram, and he chooses not to, this is, this is where he carries reward. But if a person had the opportunity and something else came in between them that stopped them from doing it, otherwise they would have done it, then this is, you know, you don't get reward for that. Right? You don't get any reward for that. So the condition for getting the reward is if you leave it off with the intention of obeying Allah's command. What if you deliberately avoid Yeah, that also applies. Right? That also applies. You have that intention, but you have the opportunity to do it. Then you're rewarded for that intention of, of leaving it off. All right. Uh, so the example of killing, the example of devouring the, the, another person's property. Do not devour another person's property by unlawful means. All right. If you do so, you are sinful. You are deserving of punishment. If you leave it off, seeking to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that condition, then you can be re rewarded for it. Uh, if you have the opportunity to do it and you choose not to do it for Allah's sake, then you are deserving a reward. All right, after that, number 10 is what we call al makru disliked. All right, the makru is of two categories makru tahrimiyan and makru tanzihiyan. Tahrimiyan is very similar to haram. It's very similar to haram. This is something that Allah has ordered us not, uh, to leave, not to do. But it does not reach the extent of being unlawful. But it's very close. Right? It's very close. Uh, but there's, there still might be punishment if you, if, you deliberately do, if you deliberately do something like this. It might not fall under the category of haram, but uh, it, you still might be subject to punishment. An right? example of, that, of this is uh, praying nafil prayers at, at sunrise or sunset. So we have been prohibited to pray when the sun is actually setting right? or when the sun is rising. These are times that you should not be praying. Right, if a person hears this hadith, right, that Rasulullah said, do not pray when the sun is rising or the sun is setting, but then they go and pray, then this is what we call makruh tahrimiyan. Right? This is, it's not to the level of unlawful, but it's very close, right? very close to being unlawful. And you might be punished, uh, you, can, you can be subject to punishment based on that. And that's another time too, when the sun is straight overhead as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. According to some, some people say it's makru. Some people say it's haram. Majority of people say it's haram because of the proven effects, proven harms of it. Right. But um, most uh, there's some people who say that it is makru. All right. So makru uh, tahrimiyan. Most most scholars will not distinguish between this and haram. They will consider it to be essentially the same thing. Right? And then you have makru tanzihiyan, which is uh, what Allah has ordered us not to do, to leave off, uh, but not decisively. In other words, if you do, not, if you, if you do it, there is no punishment if you do it, but you should leave it off. And if you leave it off with the intention of obeying Allah's command, then you can be rewarded for it. All right? An example of this is uh, a person who is making hajj, fasting, on the day of Arafah are the one who's making Hajj. So it's not the sin of Rasulullah to fast on the day of Arafah when you're at Hajj. You shouldn't fast, right? Because that's not the Sunnah to do so. But if a person does fast on that day, what is the ruling on that? This is disliked, right? It's disliked to fast for the one who's making Hajj, but it is not prohibited, right? It is not prohibited. Mm -hmm. For the person who's making Hajj? Okay, okay. 
All right, so but this would be an example of maku. And there's another, a lot of other examples we can give. Uh, but the concept is that uh, if you do it, you're not punished. But if you stay away from it with the intention of obeying Allah, then you, uh, you will be rewarded. This is the opposite, so makru is, is the opposite of the mandub category. Recommended. All right, mandub is the opposite. Uh, makru and mandub, recommended, disliked. That's the opposite. Uh, but you said that sunnah. No, okay. sunnah is another name for uh, mandub. Okay. Yes. No, there's only there's only one. Yeah, those are subcategories. But we're, right, we're giving the general categories right now. Even, even the other schools have that as well. The other schools have that as well. All right, number 11, Al-Ada. Al-Ada. This is, uh, translated to mean current performance. This is when you perform an act of worship within a specified time. All right, so you pray dhuhr on time, then you have performed the dhuhr, Ada'an. Right, you have done Ada of Salat al dhuhr All right, you fast in the month of Ramadan. This is Ada. If you miss a day in Ramadan because you were sick, because you were traveling, and then you make it up outside Ramadan, this is called Qada, which is number 12. All right, so these are opposites. So if you perform the act of worship in its correct time, then this is called Ada. If you, if you perform it after the time has expired, this is called Qada. All right, so these are, these are opposites. So you, prefer, you perform Salat al-Dhuhr at the time of Salat al-Asr, this, is, this would be Qada. This would not be Ada. All right, if, if you miss a act of worship, a mandatory act of worship, then you must make it up, whether you have an excuse or not. All right, so somebody, the, the time of Salat al-Maghrib came in and they were playing video games. So, you know, I don't want to stop my video games until, uh, until I finish the game. And the Salat al-Maghrib goes out, the time expires. They still have to make it up, all right? Or you miss Salat al-Maghrib because you were sleeping. You, you missed it because you were sleeping. You still have to make it up. Either way, you have to make it up. If you miss an obligatory action, act of worship, you have to make it up. The only difference is that uh, if you make, miss it up, if you miss it without excuse, then you are sinful. And if you miss it with excuse, then you are not sinful. All right. But either way, you have to make it up. All right. As Allah says in the Quran, "فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ الشَّهْرَ فَالْيَسُومُ." Whoever uh, witnesses the month and you are witnesses the month of Ramadan, then you should uh, fast. But if you are ill or on a journey, then you should fast a number of other days making it up, right? Yeah. All right, so the question is, if you miss a salah, and then the next salah comes in, which one do you pray first? You should pray it in order, all right? Pray them in order, as long as you don't fear that this, the current salah is going to expire, all right? So let's say you miss Maghrib, and it's Isha time now. All right, um, pray Maghrib first, then pray Isha, unless the time of Isha is about to expire, then make sure you get that in, all right, and then you pray the Maghrib afterwards. All right, so this is uh, Ada, current performance, and Qada, making up. All right, and the final term is I'ad, repetition. Repetition, this is if you already performed an act of worship, and then you perform it again. All right, so let's say you pray Dhuhr at home. All right, you pray Dhuhr at home. And then you leave your house to go somewhere, and you pass by the masjid, and you find that they're praying Salat al-Dhuhr at the masjid. You pray Salat al-Dhuhr again. This is called I'ada, right, repetition. Why would you do that? Because you want to get the reward of the jama'ah. Right, so this is permissible. Right, and this is actually recommended. You pray Dhuhr already by yourself. You didn't get the reward of jama'ah. And you come, you find that they're praying in the masjid. You pray it again. This is called i'ada, and this is recommended, right, to attain the reward. But you have to have a reason for repeating, right? If you pray dhuhr by yourself at home, and then you want to pray it at home again, no, right? Because there's no need to do so. There's no reward in that. There's, there's, you only would repeat if there's a, if there's a benefit in repeating. Yes.
So you prayed your salah already because you're traveling. And then you, and then you, and then you return to your hometown. You're still in the masjid. And this, the salah you just came prayed in. Same thing. You can pray again. Yeah, and then, but, do you, but you would pray full with them. You would, not, you would not shorten. You would pray full. And you get the reward of the jama'ah. Yeah. So that would be a reason why you would repeat. Yes. They're praying the jama'ah. Yeah. So you miss Asr yeah. and, and you find them praying the jama'ah. So pray in the jama'ah because if you, if, you, if, you, if you don't pray in the jama'ah, you miss the jama'ah. Right? But you can still make up the Asr afterwards. Right? So you prioritize the jama'ah to get the reward of the jama'ah and then you pray the Asr afterwards. Right, so you missed Dhuhr and they're praying Asr. So you want to pray your Dhuhr be behind them and they're praying Asr. Uh, this is, there is a difference of opinion amongst the scholars, but uh, the, the view that we go with is that you can do that. That you can, you can, you can mix intentions. You can intend Dhuhr and they, have it intend, and they intend Asr and that's okay. So you can make that intention and that's okay and that's permissible, inshallah. So what way is uh, taking from the numbers? As long as uh, the salah is in the, in, in the same uh, general form, you can, uh, you can, you can pray behind. Right? You just have to make, make up that one rakah. So what they say is that, uh, for example, like if you pray salat al-kusuf, the, the eclipse prayer, right? because that has two rakus, you can't, you, can't, you can't join intentions for that. Because the salah is different in its structure. Right? Or salat al-janazah, which has no ruku and no sujood. You cannot... Pray Dhuhr behind somebody praying Salat al janazah because the structure is different. Right? But the other Salawat, the structure is essentially the same. It's made up of one Rukur, two Sujood, right? standing, sitting in between. So you can, you can make your intention and pray behind uh, that person. Yes. Yeah, but you'd have to stand up and make up, make up the, the one after that. All right, but let's, uh, we're, we're going to have to pause here because this is... That's a different topic, and we're, gonna, we're not going to finish if we, if we go into that. Uh, 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 yeah, well, uh, the, when, we get, when we study fiqh salah, inshallah, we'll, we'll get to all those questions. All right? But um, if we don't move on, then we're not going to finish. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah, we'll have a fiqh salah class that will come up. All right, let, let's leave that until the end. Let's, let's get through what we're going to get through. And then if there's time at the end, we'll come back to these uh, salah questions, inshallah. All right, otherwise we're, we're going to... <laughs> no, these, these discussions are okay, but, but we need to um, make sure that... Inshallah. All right. Um, all right, the last thing we're going to do, inshallah, is <clears throat> a little bit about um, schools of fiqh. And difference of opinion, right? This, is, this question always comes up when we study fiqh. All right, what are these madahib about? Uh, why is there difference of opinion? And so on. All right, number one, we have discussed this before previously. Who can derive rulings from the Quran and the Sunnah? And uh, first, fiqh refers to rulings derived from the Quran and the Sunnah and the second, secondary sources, right? Fiqh is the rulings that come from the Quran and the Sunnah and the other sources, analogy, consensus, right? This is what fiqh is. Who can derive these rulings? You must be qualified, right? You must be qualified. Not anybody who could just come along and you know, picks up the Qur'an, picks up a hadith, can come and say this is halal, this is haram, this is recommended, this is not, right? This is not for anybody and anybody to do. All right? And this is something that uh, requires qualifications, it requires a methodology. All right? Not anyone can just come and uh, derive their own sources of Islamic law. All right, and this is something that we uh, accept for any field, right? Any field of expertise, we accept that there needs to be qualifications, right? If somebody is uh, performing a surgery on you, 
you want to make sure that that doctor is qualified, right? Nobody's ever going to go to uh, a doctor, or somebody to perform an operation, and that doc and that person has not uh, is not qualified in, in medicine, right? So we accept this for any field of expertise. If you want to become a doctor, you need to go to medical school, you need to take the MCAT exams, you need to do uh, certifications, and you need to follow procedures, All right? If you want to become a lawyer, you have to graduate law school, you have to take the the bar exam, and any other field is like this, right? So same thing for when it comes to Islamic law, you need to have the necessary qualifications, and even more so for Islamic law because the consequences carry over into the next life. Right? Somebody gives you a wrong answer. This can not only potentially uh, cost you in this life, but in the next life, which is even more important. Right? Somebody tells you, you don't need to have wudu to pray. It's only recommended. Right? Don't worry about it. If you, you, know, if you don't have wudu, you, know, you can just stand up and pray. And you follow that person. And you pray 50 years like that, you know, on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, you're going to be in big problems, right? So we accept that in any field, you need to have qualifications before you can derive rulings, all right? Uh, and this is meant for the person who has attained those qualifications. All right, so therefore, you need to be, we need to be very careful when it comes to slogans, right? Slogans. So we all agree that we have to follow the Qur'an and Sunnah, right? Everybody agrees with that. Nobody disagrees that we have to follow the Qur'an and Sunnah. But do we just come and accept, anybody says, follow the Qur'an and Sunnah, and you just go with it, all right? No, all right? So be careful with slogans, because somebody can come and say, I follow the Qur'an and Sunnah, or this is based on the Qur'an and Sunnah, but it might not be really so, all right? So slogans, they are good, but you need to be careful with slogans, all right? We had a, there's a misguided uh, group, right? one of the famous misguided groups, uh, which the scholars of Ahl Sunnah all agree that this group is misguided. They're called the Mu'tazila, right? And they're translated to mean the rationalist. Rationalist. They preferred reason over revelation. They say, they say that when reason and revelation conflict, we take a reason and we discard the revelation. In, in a nutshell, that's, that's their beliefs, right? This group, by consensus of the scholars of the Sunnah, they are misguided. Do you know what they used to call themselves? They used to call themselves Ahlul Adli wa Tawheed. They said that we are the people of, of justice and Tawheed. So if you're a person who's easily duped by slogans, and you hear, you know, we are a people of Tawheed, we are the people of Adl and Tawheed, then you're going to fall into problems following the group that, by consensus of the scholars of the Sunnah, is misguided. All right? So be very careful when somebody comes, just comes and says, we are people of Tawheed, we are people of Sunnah, we are people of Quran and Sunnah. These slogans are good. We don't reject them, but we, they must meet the reality. All right? Uh, another example is the very first deviant group to come out of Islam. Anybody knows what group that was? Khawarij, right? Very first misguided group was the group called Al Khawarij. And they were initially on the uh, side of Ali. Radiallahu an. So Ali, radiallahu an, uh, as is well known in Islamic history, he had some issues and problems with Muawiyah radiallahu an, and they went to war with each other. They had a battle and they went to war with each other. And uh, this group called the Khawarij, they were initially with Ali radiallahu an. And Ali fought with Muawiyah. There was a big battle called the Battle of Safin. And they had the battle. And after the battle, they decided that we're going to go to arbitration. In other words, we're going to appoint an independent person to judge between us. All right? So they said, we're, gonna, we're not going to fight anymore. We're going to appoint somebody to judge between us. And they appointed uh, another companion by the name of Abu Musa al-Ashari to, ju to judge between them. So the Khawarij, they were initially part of Ali's army. And they said, this is invalid. This is invalid. We cannot have another, uh, there's no judge. Because only Allah can judge. They said, only Allah can judge. لا حكم إلا لله. There's no judgment except for Allah. And they brought Qur'an. They brought Qur'an, right? They brought a verse in the Qur'an. إِنِ الْحُكْمُ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ They said that, they, they brought this verse, uh, which is that there is no judgment except for Allah's judgment. Judgment only belongs to Allah. All right? So they brought Qur'an. Right? Are they following Qur'an? They're following Qur'an. They have Qur'an. So, and they used this verse. They said that judgment only belongs to Allah. And therefore, they used this verse to declare Ali, radiallahu anhu, and Muawiyah, and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, and all the Sahabu who took part in this, they said, you guys are all disbelievers. You've all become disbelievers. Because 
judgment only belongs to Allah. And if you appoint a judge be, be, uh, besides Allah, then you have legislated uh, in something that only Allah has right to, to do so. And so they said, Ali, you're a disbeliever. Muawiyah, you're a disbeliever. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, you dis you're a disbeliever. Everybody, all the senior Sahaba, they said you guys are no longer believers anymore. You're all disbelievers. Right? And what, they, what, they, what are they doing? They brought Quran. Right? They brought a verse in the Quran. Nobody rejects the Quran. So Ali radiallahu anhu, when he heard this, right, he said a very famous statement. He said, Kalimatu haqqin urida biha batim. It's a statement of truth. This is the Quran. Nobody rejects the Quran. Right? So you, yes, we accept the verse of the Quran. It's Quran. But the understanding is off. Kalimatu haqqin urida biha batim. But the, what they intend by this verse is wrong. They intend falsehood by it. So it's not just about having Quran or not about having hadith, but it is the understanding of it, the correct understanding of it. So the Khawarij, they had Quran. They brought a verse in the Quran, but it was completely off. Their understanding was off. And based on this understanding, they declared all of the senior Sahaba to be disbelievers based on misunderstanding and misinterpreting a verse. Right? Uh, another thing from the Khawarij is that they would declare anybody who commits major sins to be disbelievers. So if you steal, you are a disbeliever. If you commit zina, you're a disbeliever. If you drink alcohol, you're a disbeliever. This was also one of their positions. And they had hadith. They brought a hadith. And we had mentioned this hadith in uh, the, the branches of Iman class. Right? Where Rasulullah says in the hadith, لا يزني أزاني حين يزني وهو مؤمن That the adulterer, when he commits adultery, is not a believer. So they brought hadith, right? And the, the hadith also continues, وَلَا يَسْرِقْ السَّارِقْ حِينَ يَسْرِقْ وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ And the, the thief, uh, when he steals and he's committing the act of theft, he's not a believer. So they brought hadith, but their understanding was off. All right? So it's not just about having Qur'an and Sunnah. It needs to be followed up with the correct understanding of the Qur'an and Sunnah, or else you fall into mistakes of the khawarij and other misguided groups. All right, so when we say uh, we need, there needs to be qualifications and you need to be wary of, be careful of just mere slogans of Quran and Sunnah, there needs to be a reality uh, beyond that. All right, which brings us to the schools of fiqh, the madhahib. All right, so what is a madhab? All right, so we have four main madhabs, which are Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanbali. All right, so what is a madhab? A madhab is essentially a systematic and principal way of understanding the Qur'an and Sunnah. Because right? as we see with the example of the Khawarij, if you don't have a principal understanding way, then you'll end up declaring the companions of Rasulullah to be disbelievers. Right? So you, we, there needs to be a systematic and principal way of understanding the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And this is essentially what a madhab is. All right? A madhab is a scholar who has reached a certain level of knowledge and he has a system in which he derives the rulings of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. All right, without a proper methodology, then the consequences, as we said, are serious. Right? The Khawarij didn't have this proper methodology, and so they fell into major errors and major mistakes and ended up declaring the companions of Rasulullah SAW to be disbelievers. So if you do not have a systematic and principal way of deriving the rulings from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, then you can end up causing a lot of harm. All right, so there are four madhabs that have been preserved and accepted uh, over the course of Islamic history, and there were actually more than that. All right, so these are four that remained, but there were actually more madhabs than that. So there was uh, the madhab of, for example, a scholar by the name of Al-Layth ibn Sa'ad. He was in Egypt. He had his own madhab. And in fact, they said that he was more knowledgeable than Imam Malik, but his students wasted his knowledge. They didn't, they didn't preserve his, 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 his knowledge, and so his madhab died out eventually. Right? You also had the madhab of uh, Sufyan al-Thawri, another scholar. Madhab of Imam al-Awza'i, another scholar. Madhab of Ibn Jarir al-Tabari. All these, all these scholars had their own madhahib. Right? So there were much more than four. There were several, maybe a dozen madha madhahib. But these four remained due to Allah, Allah granting acceptance of, of, of the ummah for them and other, other factors. It could be political, geographical. But for whatever reason, Allah knows best, these four uh, were preserved and they became accepted by the Ummah and they remain until today, right? These four, the Hanafi Madhab, Maliki Madhab, Shafi'i Madhab, and Hanbali Madhab. All right, now these uh, Madhahib, uh, where did they get their legitimacy, legitimacy from? 
right? So we say these madahib, right? They are the madahib of the sunnah. They're all based on the Quran and the sunnah, right? They're all based on the Quran and the sunnah. But where do they get their legitimacy and authority from? They go back to the Prophet ﷺ because they all go back to the Prophet ﷺ. Right? All of these madahib, they go back in a chain to the Prophet ﷺ. Alright? And so they are essentially taking their understanding of the religion from the Prophet ﷺ, who taught it to his companions, who taught it to their students, and so on. Alright? As opposed to like the example we gave of the Khawarij. The Khawarij, where did they take their understanding from? Their own selves. Alright? And so they made mistakes. Alright, as for the madahib, Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Shafi'i, Ahmad, they're not taking it from their own, they're not making these things up. They are taking it from their teachers, who took it from their teachers, who took it from the Sahaba, who took it from the Prophet And so this is why these madahib have authority, because they are extensions of the understanding of the Quran and Sunnah as understood by the Sahaba. Alright, so for example, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, he, he, he had a lot of teachers, of course. His main teacher was uh, a scholar by the name of Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman. Right? Hamad was a student. His main teacher was Ibrahim al nakhari Ibrahim al nakhari his main teacher was Al-Qama. Al-Qama was the most famous student of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, of course, is a senior Sahabi. And he di learned directly from the Prophet Sallallahu So Imam Abu Hanifa's madhab, it goes back to Ibn Mas'ud by way of Ibn Mas'ud. Right? Ibn, uh, Abu Hanifa, he settled in Kufa. Right? And after the Prophet ﷺ died, there were several Sahaba who moved to Kufa. Amongst them was Ibn Mas'ud. And amongst them was Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali, when he became Khalifa, he moved the capital from Medina to Kufa. So there were several Sahaba, sahaba who settled in Kufa, and they taught the religion. And Imam Abu Hanifa is a product of this. Right? He's a product of this. So. Uh, Abu Hanifa goes back to his teachers who go back to Ibn Mas'ud, who goes back to the Prophet And they actually did, uh, there was, they did some studies actually, they, and they found that 92%, uh, this is a study that was done, done in one of the universities in Jordan, right? and they, they found that 92% of the fiqh of Ibn Mas'ud was later adopted by the Hanafi Madhab. So essentially the Hanafi Madhab is the fiqh of Abdullah Ibn Mas'ud. Right? So when somebody comes and says that, well, the Hanafi Madhab is not following the Quran and Sunnah. Then what you're, what, you're kind of say, what you're actually kind of saying is that well, you're telling Abu, Abdullah bin Mas'ud that you're not following the Quran and Sunnah. Who would, who would say that, right? Who would have the audacity to tell Abdullah bin Mas'ud, senior, senior companion, that you are not following the Sunnah? Right? So Abu Hanifa, his fiqh goes back to Abdullah bin Mas'ud by way of his teachers, goes back to the Prophet Right? Uh, Imam Malik, Imam Malik, he was born in Medina. And he died in Medina. He lived all his life in Medina. He did not leave Medina except for Hajj and Umrah. And he took from the scholars of Medina. The scholars of Medina, where did they take their fiqh from? They took it from the Sahaba who were settled in Medina. And we know that uh, Medina was the place where the majority of the Sahaba were. After the Prophet ﷺ died, this is where the, the companions they made the Hijrah to. And this is where the majority of Sahaba have remained. Not all of them, most of them remained in Medina after the Prophet ﷺ died. Some of them went to Kufa, some of them went to Mecca, but the majority of them remained in Medina. So Imam Malik, he took his fiqh, he took his uh, fiqh from the scholars of Medina who took it from the Sahaba who were in Medina. All right, so his fiqh goes back to the, the Sahaba of Medina, which goes back to the Prophet All right, Imam Shafi'i, he initially started uh, studying in Mecca. He took from the students of Ibn Abbas. All right, and Ibn Abbas is a companion, he took from Rasulullah all right, later on, Imam Shafi'i, he went to Medina and he studied under Imam Malik. So now he took Imam Malik's fiqh and he combined between the two. All right? Then later on, he went to Iraq and he studied with students of Imam Abu Hanifa. So he took from the fiqh of, uh, of the students of Imam Abu Hanifa. Then later on, he went to Egypt and he combined between all the schools after that. And he made his own madhab. All right, Imam Ahmed, he studied with Imam Shafi'i amongst others. So he took from uh, who Imam Shafi'i took from, who took from Imam Malik, and he took from all, the, uh, all these, and all, they're all going back to the Prophet right? So these madahib, they're all based on the Quran and Sunnah. They're not, these are not things that people are making up. Right? The, uh, all these imams did not make up their fiqh. They got it from their teachers, who got it from their teachers, who got it from the Sahaba, who got it from Rasulullah Alright, so this is essentially uh, where the authority of these madahib come from. 
All right, following the madhab, there are areas of agreement when it comes to uh, these madhahib. Number one is that there is condemnation of fanaticism and animosity. In other words, uh, there are people obviously who take this to an extreme level to the point where they will not give salam to somebody who's from a different madhab. Or they will not pray behind somebody who's from a different madhab. Or they will not allow their children to marry somebody who's from a different madhab. Right? All of this is a type of fanaticism uh, and animosity that is, uh, that is looked down upon. Right? So there's no difference of opinion that, what, that uh, fanaticism, madhab fanaticism should be avoided to the point where you believe that uh, because this person is from another madhab that you, know, you, you boycott that person and you stay away from that person. This is right, agreed upon. That this is something blameworthy. All right, also, uh, acceptance of these four schools. These four schools have been accepted from the, by the ummah for the past thousand plus years. Allah has granted acceptance of these schools for the past, past thousand plus years. Every scholar, almost every scholar who has been produced by the ummah, they studied these, they were affiliated with one of these madhab. Every, every scholar, you can name a scholar, and we can give you the, the madhab that they, they, are initi they initially studied or affiliated with. And this goes to almost every single scholar who have, who, have, who have been produced by the ummah. They all took from these madhab. So these madhab have existed, and they will continue to exi exist. Uh, following the evidence, uh, this is also a, a point of agreement, that if a person has reached the necessary qualifications, and they've they reached that level of ijtihad, then they are bound to follow the evidence, and they are not allowed to follow anybody else, when, once you have reached that level. Once you have reached a level of ijtihad, when you are qualified, then it becomes haram for you to follow anybody else. You must follow the evidences. Right? This is also a point of agreement. Yes. So, yes. So what are the qualifications of mujtahid? There are a number of qualifications. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you have to have a solid grounding in the Arabic language. Right? Because the Quran is revealed in Arabic. If you don't know Arabic, then there's, there's no way you can possibly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is, that's a disputed claim. That's a disputed claim. But essentially, uh, solid understanding of the Arabic language, you have to have understanding of all the ayat of ahkam, specifically. So there are verses, the Quran, the Quran has over 6,000 verses. About maybe like 500 of those are ayat related to rulings. So a person who, who, is, who, who, who is intending to reach the level which they had, they must have knowledge of all these ayat, all the verses that deal with legislation, all the ahadith that deal with legislation. They have to know where, where the scholars agree, where they disagree. A number of conditions, so we're not going to go through all of them, but there is a stringent criteria before you can reach this level of where you are you able to independently follow the evidences. All right, um, as for following a madhab, following a madhab, there has been three positions that have also come in, uh, that have been propagated. The first is that it's obligatory. There's some people who say that it is obligatory, that you must follow uh, a madhab, and the reason they say this is for to, to prevent people from picking and choosing what to follow, right? So, uh, if if you open the door for people to follow any anything that they fo uh, anything that they want, then you're going to end up having people taking the easiest position, right? So this madhab is a very easy position. I'll follow it in this. This madhab is an easy position in this topic. I'll follow in that, and then you end up uh, following the easiest position of following your desires. So those scholars who say it's obligatory to follow a madhab, they say that to prevent people from following into following their desires. That if you follow a madhab, then at least you are, you know, you're following something and you're not, you're not choosing what to follow. Right? You're not making your own legislation up. Right? And the second position is that it's permissible. Not obligatory, but permissible. You can, it's allowed to follow, but it is not mandatory. With the condition that you're following something though. In other words, you're not, you can't be making it up, right? As we said, the only, the only scenario where you can follow the Qur'an and Sunnah on your own is if you have reached the level of qualification, right? Which you have reached the level of qualification. If you do not reach that level of qualification, then you need to be following somebody else. You need to be following the scholars. So if you're not on that level, then you need to follow. Now, do you have to follow a madhab or can you just follow any scholar? This is an area of dispute, right? But uh, at the end of the day, you have to follow somebody. Right? You have to follow somebody if you have not reached that level of 
independently being able to derive the, the rulings of the Quran and Sunnah on your own. Right, so the question is, the Prophet says that in the hadith that he was never given a choice between two options except that he chose the easier one. All right, the answer to that would be that those two options are both permissible. All right, they're both allowed. But in the case of when it comes to the difference of the scholars, one is correct, the other is not. All right, one is correct, the other is not correct. As opposed to the choice he had was, was both of them are correct, but one is easier. All right, so there's a difference. The difference between one is correct, right? They cannot be both correct, right? So this scholar says, or this madhab says that this thing is halal. And this one says it is haram. It cannot be both. It's either halal or haram, right? So uh, because one is only correct, then you don't have the choice anymore. But if they're both, it's a choice between two things that are permissible, then this is when the Prophet would choose the easier of the two, as long as they're both permissible. Yes, it comes up very often. And we'll, we'll get to that, inshallah. But there's yeah. also a point here as well, correct, that it's not just a matter of following the pieces, but also the idea of being consistent. Yes, right, yes. That if you follow one approach, they might have derived that one way and have to move in this. Right. Yeah, this is another reason they give for, for following, is that that madhab has a specific methodology that they follow to get to that ruling. So if you choose it in this particular issue, and then, you choose, and then you choose a different method and a different issue, then you're kind of complaining between two different methodologies, right? Which is, it can be, and, and it being contradictory. Yes? So there are things that are wrong, and you have to Wrong as in, only one is correct. But we don't know what that correct one is necessarily. I will get to that. I will get to that, inshallah, uh, at the end. All right, well, it comes to the next point, the final point we'll talk about today, which is, uh, difference of opinion. All right, so we said that all these madahib, right, they existed. They all go back to the, they all trace back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Uh, all the four madahib, they go back to the Sahaba, they go back to the Sahaba who took from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they're all based on the Quran and the Sunnah. They're all based on the Quran and the Sunnah. Uh, then why are there differences, right? Why are there differences if they're all going back to the Sahaba and they're all going back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Shouldn't they all be uh, the same? Right, so this is a question that comes up. And uh, the answer to that is that there are, the reason why there are differences is it comes down to two main factors, the mind of the scholar and the nature of the text. Meaning that you can have one text, right, a verse in the Quran or a hadith, and a person, due to the nature of people, will have one understanding, and another person might have a different understanding, a completely different understanding. A person might see a statement, and they might take it literally. And another person might have another statement, uh, say the, t take the same statement figuratively. Right? And this happens, and we'll give an example of that, uh, in the hadith of Rasulullah uh, So it comes down to the mind of the person, the mind of the scholar. A person might look at the same exact statement and come away with a different conclusion due to the nature of the text. The text allows a different conclusion to come. Right? The text allows a different conclusion to come. And the primary example of that is the very famous hadith of Salat al-Asr fi Bani Quraidha. Right, this is a very famous hadith. And this shows the, this whole concept of allowing differences of opinion because this is from the Prophet Sallallahu himself. Right, so this uh, goes back to uh, during the Battle of, Bani, uh, Battle of Ahzab. Battle of Ahzab in which the Mushrikun, they gathered in a confederacy of uh, uh, of armies, and they laid siege to Medina, right? And he dug, he dug the ditch, right? This is the Battle of the Trench. And behind the Muslims were a tribe in Medina called Banu Quraidha. They were the last remaining Jewish tribe in Medina. And during this battle, they conspired with the Mushrikun to betray the Muslims, right? They, they conspired to betray the Muslims, and they broke their, they broke their agreement with Rasulullah and they were going to attack the Muslims from behind. Right? But Allah caused the army of the Mushrikun to leave. 
uh, Allah sent a strong wind and there was some adverse weather and so they packed up and left. So the battle was ended like that by natural way. By natural means Allah sent the wind to blow away their tents and blow away all their supplies and they got fed up and they left. So after the battle was finished, Rasulullah he told the companions, don't, uh, the, the battle is not really done yet. We need to go to Bani Quraidah because they broke their agreement with us and we need to fight them. So he told them in very clear terms, لا يصلينا أحد صلاة العصر إلا في بني قريضة. None of you should pray صلاة العصر except at the quarters of بني قريضة. Nobody pray صلاة العصر until you get to بني قريضة. So the Sahaba they left, and as they were going on their way to بني قريضة, the sun is about to set. The sun is about to set, and they have not reached بني قريضة yet. So what happens? They split into two groups. One group said, we're not praying until we get to Bani Quraidah. Because the Prophet said, we're not praying. He said, don't pray until you get to Bani Quraidah. So one group said, we're not praying until we get to Bani Quraidah. The other group said, he did not mean for us to miss the Salah. What he meant was, hurry up, be quick. But he did not mean for us, the, for the sun to set and for you to miss the Salah. He did not intend that. Because Allah says in the Quran, in the Salah kanat. Salah is in prescribed times. It's in set times. He did not mean for us to miss the Salah. He meant for us to hurry up. But if the Salah time is going to expire, pray. So they split. And one group prayed on the road. And the other group continued on. And they did not pray until they got to Bani Quraidah. And they prayed Asr after the time. Which is called what? Qada. So they prayed after the time. All right. Um, and this came to Rasulullah this got back to him. All right, this got back to him. Um, before we get to that, um, I want to take a poll. All right, I want to take a poll. If you were a Sahabi at the time of the Prophet Wasallam, in that time, and he gave you these instructions, do not pray Salat al Asr until you get to Bani Quraidah, what would you do? All right, so let's, those who would pray on the road, because the time is going to expire. Raise your hand. Who would pray? Okay. Those who would say, no, he said, don't pray until you get to Bani Quraidah. We're not praying Asr until we get to Bani Quraidah. Okay. Most people say they would follow the literal, right? Literal words of Rasulullah and they would not pray. All right. So this is, um, let's go to the hadith. This hadith is in Sahih Bukhari, by the way, right? It's not on the screen there. When the Prophet ﷺ returned from the battle of Ahzab, the Confederates, he said to us, none should offer the Asr prayer but at Bani Quraidah. The Asr prayer became due for some, uh, for some of them on the way. Some of them decided not to offer the Salah but at Bani Quraidah, while others decided to offer the Salah on the spot. So they split. The Sahaba split up. Some of them said that he did not mean for us to miss the Salah. He meant for us to hurry up. Others said, no, we're not praying because he said, don't pray until you get to Bani Quraidah. So some of them offered the Salah on the spot, on the road. Others, they waited. Uh, and then this was told to the Prophet ﷺ. It came back to the Prophet ﷺ. And he did not blame any one of them. He did not blame any one of them. He allowed both of them to interpret the hadith according to the way they understand it. And he did not tell them either. Not only did he did not blame them, but he did not tell them who was right either. He didn't say this group was right. I meant this. He allowed them to interpret the hadith according to their understanding. And this hadith is a basis for accepting differences of opinion. That the Sahaba, they differed with the Prophet ﷺ's presence, with his knowledge. And he allowed them to differ. And he allowed them to interpret the hadith in each, the way each group interpreted it. He did not blame any group. And he did not even... Uh, tell them this was what I intended Indicating that he, This is something that is allowed It is allowed It is allowed to differ on the text As long as the text allow for differing right? As long as the text allow for differing Then this is something that is allowed As long as it is done by somebody qualified right? Not anybody who would just come and read the text You're qualified and it's based on a proper methodology Which was what we have here 
that this was done by qualified individuals, the Sahaba, and they were following a proper methodology. Right? One was interpreting the words of Rasulullah literally, the other was going on based on other evidences, which is that Salah is due on prescribed times. And he didn't mean for us to uh, leave off the Salah entirely and miss it, but he rather meant for us to hurry up. And Rasulullah accepted both of these interpretations, and he did not blame uh, any group. All right, so this hadith is uh, the, the main hadith, and this is explicit from Rasulullah that difference of opinion is allowed. It is allowed, and it is not uh, rejected, or it is, it is not blameworthy, as long as it meets certain conditions. As long as it meets certain conditions. All right, uh, so the final point here is, uh, when it comes to on these differences, is that as long as it is a legitimate difference of opinion, it should not be a cause of dispute or disunity. All right, as long as the difference of opinion is legitimate, it should not be a cause of dispute or disunity. Number two, excusing opponents in legitimate differences. If somebody comes to a different conclusion and they are qualified, and this is based on a sound methodology, then the, we, we say that we, you know, we don't agree with you, but we excuse them because they did their best. Right? They did their best to come to what they believe to be the truth. So we make excuses. We don't use that as a source of disunity or dispute. And we allow these different differences. All right? We excuse the, the opponents who are of a different, uh, of a different, um, of a different opinion. At the same time, believing that what we're following is true, right? You know, you have to believe what you're following is true as well. And this occurred with uh, Imam Malik. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, he wrote a book called Al-Muwatta. Right? He wrote a book called Al-Muwatta, which is his a book on hadith and fiqh, combined hadith and fiqh, which represents his madhab. And uh, the Khalif at the time, Harun al-Rashid, was impressed by this book. And he wanted to make this book the standard across the entire Islamic world. In other words, everybody has to become... Maliki. This is, the, this is what the Khalifa wanted to do. So he wrote to Imam Malik, he said that I want you to make this book the constitution. Everybody has to follow this. Right? And nobody, we're not going to accept any, anything else but Imam Malik's fiqh. So Imam Malik, he believes he's right. right? He believes that the, the fiqh he's following is correct. And he received this letter from Harun al-Rashid. But he said, and look at his wisdom, he said that no, don't do that. Because the, the Sahaba of Rasulullah after he died, they, 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 they spread apart. And some of them went to Mecca, and some of them went to Kufa, and some of them went to Basra, and then some of them went to Damascus. They all split up, and they all had students, and they all taught the Sunnah of Rasulullah And so all of these different localities, they're all following the tradition of Rasulullah based on what they received. So don't force people to follow the tradition that I received, because I'm taking from what I learned from my teachers who took from the Sahaba in Medina. But those other localities, they're following what they learned from their teachers who learned from the Sahaba who are in Kufa, who are in uh, Basra, who are in Damascus and other, other places. So Imam Malik said no, that they are following uh, legitimate positions as well. So don't force everybody to follow what my madhab is or my fiqh is. All right, so, uh, we excuse the opponents who, are, who have different opinions, at the same time don't use it as a cause for disunity and dispute. And also do not follow in concessions. So this is something uh, agreed upon that you should not follow the concessions. So, so uh, each madhab sometimes will have a very lenient position. It is not allowed for somebody to take the lenient position of every madhab. So this madhab is very, very easy, lax when it comes to this particular issue. So I'm going to follow it. And, and then for this madhab, it has lax and easy for another issue, so I'm going to follow it. Right, and so a person ends up following the easiest in every madhab, this is called tatabu' ruhas, right? Following uh, concessions, and this is something, by agreement of the scholars, it should be avoided, right? So when it comes to these differences, you don't search out for the easiest of all these opinions and just follow that. And as we said at the end, uh, previously, the truth is one, right? When Allah, uh, uh, Allah says something in the Quran or His Messenger says something, He intends one thing, all right, he intends one thing. They cannot be both correct. All right? So the intended, uh, the truth is with one group. However, as we saw in the case of the Salat al Asafi Bani Quraidah, we don't necessarily know what that truth is. And when are we going to know when the truth is? Not until the Yawm al Qiyamah. Right? So if somebody follows a position, 
this is halal. Another, pro, another scholar said, this is haram. One of them is correct, the other is not correct. Right? But when are we going to know when it's who's correct or not? We won't know until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Right? We won't know until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So the truth is with one. However, because we cannot arrive with certainty who is correct, then we allow this, both of them to, we allow both, uh, each group to follow right, what they are, have arrived at, right, what they have arrived at, but we cannot claim certainly that this is 100% correct or not. Right? Unless we have something explicit from Rasulullah or explicit from Allah that this is the ruling. Yes. Generally speaking, so the question is, can a new madhab come up? Generally speaking, uh, they've exhausted everything. Right? They've exhausted everything. Um, is it possible to reach that level today? This is also an area of dispute. Right? And some, there are some who say that it is still possible to reach that level. But even if you reach that level, you will still have to go back to these anyway. All right? So uh, this is one of the reasons why they limited, the scholars limited to these four is to prevent confusion. Right? Because you have these four, they are there, and this is established. There's no need to cause more confusion introducing new New, new views or new, new, new schools. Yes, last question and then we'll uh, break for Iftar and Maghrib, inshallah. Yes. Yeah, so are there positions that some groups might come up today that go outside of the four madhab. Yes, that, that happens. And this goes back to another issue is, is it allowed to adopt an opinion outside of the four madhab? So generally speaking, generally speaking, the truth is within one of these four. Right? And this is something that even uh, Ibn Taymiyyah says that for the majority of the sharia, the, the truth does not go beyond these four madhab. Right? This is something even Ibn, Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah himself says. Uh, but is that the case for every single issue that it can only be within these four? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. But, but there's a difference between somebody coming up with something that nobody before ever said. Completely new. Nobody ever said before. Versus something that it is outside of the four madahib, but there were some other scholar. Like we said, there were other mujtahids. There were other scholars who had madahib, but their madahib just died out. Right? So it's, it's, with, it's outside of the four madahib, but at the same time, it was a legitimate view at some point. So there's a difference between those. He was Hanbali. He, started, he was a Hanbali. Of course, he, he reached a level where he became independent afterwards, but his initial training was in the Hanbali method. No, he did not establish his No, he did not, he did not establish his own method. Yes. If you follow the one that's not the truth, will you be punished? No, because your responsibility is to follow qualified scholarship. Allah says in the Quran, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. As long as you've asked the people who are qualified and they give you an answer, then you have done your part. And so you are free from blame. And the scholar, as long as he exerted his effort and he's, reached, he's qualified and he has exerted the effort and followed a sound methodology, then he not only will he will not be blameworthy, but he will actually be rewarded. Even if he's wrong, he will still be rewarded. He will not get the same reward as the one who's correct. The one who is correct will be two re receive two rewards. The one who is incorrect will receive one reward. All right, and with that, we will conclude as the time of uh, Ithar al Maghrib is here. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us beneficial knowledge. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anna astaghfiruka wa natuhu ilayhi.